for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. That, that plane crash, Johnny. Did you hear? Yeah, I just turned off my radio. It's horrible. Who is this? Oh, I'm sorry. Sam Harris, Columbia. Oh, yeah, sure. Does your company carry the policies on that airline? Yes, but I'm not thinking of that. That crash was planned. Oh, they're definite about it now? Yes, an explosion. Some kind of a bomb. There were 13 people killed in the plane, and they don't know how many in the house it crashed into. We've got to place responsibility. The company wants to do whatever it can. We've got to find whoever is responsible. Yeah, sure, Mr. Harris. You want me to go out there? Yes, we do. The airline representative is a man named Reed. Go out and do everything you can. Now, for just a moment, what do you say we take time out to talk about Star Root? Never heard of them? Well, I don't suppose many of us have, but they exist all right. Now, those of us who live in cities or in other localities where regular letter carriers drop off our mail probably never wonder how mail is handled in places where almost no one lives, where there's hardly anything and not much reason for going there. But there is someone who thought about it and did something about it, our Postmaster General. He saw to it that folks who live in these out-of-the-way places received their mail. Of course, the post office doesn't operate regular mail routes to these places because there isn't enough mail to warrant a regular postman. But the people in isolated spots, such as prospectors in the Nevada mountains or trappers in the Alaska wilderness or Louisiana bayous, are entitled to their mail. That's why the post office department has set up a system of contracting responsible agencies to deliver mail to out-of-the-way places. These special mailmen follow what are known as star routes. Deliveries are made usually to mailboxes similar to RFD boxes that stand in the middle of some barren waste or along a rarely traveled river. Star route carriers use cars, horses, mules, rowboats, dog sleds, or airplanes, whatever they need to deliver the mail. Sometimes they even walk. Yes, the job of the star route postman is a rugged one. And our hats are off to these little publicized employees of our United States Post Office Department. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Columbia All Risk Insurance Company. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the fairway matter. Expense account item one, 250, cab fare to the scene of the plane crash, which, as you know, covered quite a bit of territory. The fairway airline's plane had taken off at 8.20 p.m., had reached an altitude of no more than 600 feet, and then had crashed, setting two houses afire a short distance from the Springfield Hartford Airport. I got there a little after 9.30. One house had been partially saved, but the other had been completely demolished. The family of four living in it had been killed. The parents of one child in the first house were not expected to live. And beyond, twisted pieces of the plane were scattered across the field. Fragments still smoking, turned white by the foam from chemical extinguishers. Mr. Reed? Mr. Carl Reed? Mr. Carl Reed? Please, 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 this is hardly the time to worry about money, is it? I'm only an investigator. They hired me to help in any way I can to fix the blame. Oh, oh, I, I'm sorry I misunderstood. I, yes. Oh, uh, uh, you'll have to excuse me, Mrs. Goodyear. Uh, there are some things I have to do. Uh, come along, Mr. Dollar. Well, she doesn't know about the explosion. She thinks there's a chance her daughter wasn't on the plane, but she was. 
She was assured us. You haven't told her? I can let her hope for a couple more hours. Oh, why shouldn't I? I've had to tell so many people. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. I think even worse than if it had been an accident. When you know it was premeditated, when you know someone planned it. What kind of a person would you have to be to plan something like this? Yeah, it's hard to believe, Mr. Reed. But we have proof. There was an explosion in an extreme after section. Destroyed all the control cables to the tail assembly. I don't suppose the Civil Aeronautics man is here yet, huh? No, no, but he's on his way. They're sending one of their best. S.W. Newton. Uh, Captain Linhart of the state police is here, though. Oh? Well, I'd like to talk to him, then. Do you have any idea where he is? Well, uh, the, the last I saw him, he was over there by that... A... Oh, Smith. Hey, but see the group of men over by the hangar? Yeah. They, he might be there. They... They collected the bodies, then. Made as, as many identifications as possible. Look, I know it's bad, Mr. Reed, but don't you go to pieces. That wouldn't help at all. I, I, I'll be all right. I'll see you later. Yeah. I remembered Captain Jim Lenhart from a case we shared last year. And I found him in the group of silent men. Their silence and their expressions told better than words how they felt about the row of sheet-draped bodies on the ground. I was Reed making out. I thought it was going to pieces a little while ago. Well, he's still in pretty bad shape. He's not alone. But it might have been worse. Plane could have been filled. Yeah. Well, I guess our approach will be to try to find out which victim was the planned victim. Well, it's what we have now. I don't see any other way to start. Do you? No. The possibilities as I see them are murder with a motive, disguised suicide, or a homicidal maniac. That must cover it. I have men covering the airport in a two-mile circle around it. Their orders are to question everybody they spot and search every car. I think that's about all we can do tonight. Well, I'll see you in the morning, then. Sorry with you. Sure is. Glad to have you on the case. Meet you in my office at nine. Good. Uh, here's another ambulance. We can get the rest of these poor devils into the morgue and try to find out who they are. The next morning, the official findings were released. The explosive had been nitroglycerin. It had been detonated by some electrical means, which it was assumed was connected to a timing device that had not yet been found. Captain Lenhart's men had questioned a number of suspicious characters near the airport without result. But Lenhart himself had received an anonymous tip on a possible suspect, a Wilbur Wheeler, who was a member of the ground crew that had serviced the plane just before its takeoff. Wheeler was shown to the captain's office about 40 minutes after I'd gotten there. Why did you pick me to come up here? Why didn't you get Straker or, or, or Mills? They're over me. It's just routine, Wheeler. Routine? You must have a reason. I got a right to know if you got a reason, haven't I? Why do you think we started with you? Well, I'm asking you, aren't I? The stewardess who died in that crash, Shirley Goodhue. I knew her. We understand that she meant something to you. Weren't you in love with her? Yes. We understand you made quite a pest of yourself, phoning her at home and waiting for her at the airport. And then a week or so ago, you learned she was going to marry the co-pilot who was killed. Uh, what's his name? Bill Strand. Uh, Wasn't it, Wheeler? Yes. You're saying that you think I caused that crash. Well, you wanted to know why you were here. I told you it was just routine, Wheeler. And it would have been if you'd acted differently, but it sounds as though you're trying to hide some facts from us. I won't anymore. I I don't have any reason to. Well, then why did you? Well, I don't know. I, I've been going crazy ever since I heard about it last night. I, I was still at the field. I got sick and I had to go home. We heard about that. I got home and, and turned on my radio. And then I heard what caused the crash, the, the explosion. And I knew that a, a lot of things I've said and a lot of things I'd done were going to make trouble for me. E even getting sick and coming home was bad. What were some of the other things? Well, I said some pretty bad things to Shirley when I heard she was going to marry Strand. And I had a fight with him. You had a fight with him over the same thing? I guess for me it was really over that. He ordered me around one day and, and I didn't like it. And that's how it started. He beat me up pretty bad. Said he'd have my job. And I told him that, that I'd see the day his plane with him in it would be plastered all over some hill. 
I know what it sounds like now, but I, it didn't mean anything. It was just talk. It was plenty of that, all right. You heard enough, Dollar? I think so. And that's all, Whitley. I can go? Yeah. Nobody would be stupid enough to compromise himself the way you did and then pull a job like this. All right. I sure made a lot of mistakes. I know that. Yeah. Just be around where we can find you if we want to talk anymore. I... I can't go back to that airport, sir. I... I was going to call them and then quit. If it's all right with you. Just be where we can find you, that's all. I will. Uh, I'm sorry. A lot of people are, Whitley. Yes, sir. Collins, the man just leaving my office. Name is Wheeler. Wilbur Wheeler. Have two of the boys get on him and stay. I'll arrange to relieve them tonight. Oh. Yeah, thanks. What do you think? Well, I'd like to know what's in Wheeler's background. And I'd like to get a psychiatrist's reaction, wouldn't you? We'll learn about him. Now, well, let's get on with this list of passengers and see what we can get from their survivors. We spent the rest of the day in the efforts of six more of Captain Lenhart's men preparing files on the ten dead passengers. One file contained nothing but a name, Rupert Stone. Gotten from the ticket office records is that of a man who had paid cash for space to Augusta, Maine. The Hartford address he'd given was non-existent, and the phone number rang a bakery where no one had ever heard of a Rupert Stone. That one we dropped until the identification of the bodies was complete. Lenhart and I started out to follow up a couple of the others that evening. This is rotten work. Yeah, check. Mrs. Graham? Yes? This is Mr. Dollar, and I'm Captain Lenhart of the State Police. We'd like to talk to you about the death of your husband. No. no I, I have talked too much, it only keeps in my mind the things I saw in that field and the women crying. We know, Mrs. Graham, but it's our job to fix the responsibility. We only want to ask you a few questions. You'd want to help find whoever caused all those deaths if you could, wouldn't you? How can I help? May we come in? All right. But only a little while. I, I haven't slept. Thank you. No, no, Skipper, be quiet. He knows, poor old dog. And very soon he will die. Then I will be alone. Oh, uh, please sit down. Thank you, Mrs. Graham. Thank you. Mrs. Graham, your husband... Yes? He, uh, he bought space to Boston, didn't he? Yes. Martin's brother is buried there. Martin was a religious man, and quite often he would go to visit his brother's grave. I see. And uh, I think uh, that's all we needed, wasn't it, Dollar, to recheck his plan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that was all. Then we better go. We're sorry we had to bother you, Mrs. Graham. And thanks very much for seeing us. All right. Thanks very much. Oh, don't bother to get up. You don't have to come to the door with me. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Graham. Quiet, Skipper. You won't come back. I couldn't cut it. I think that dog did it. Sorry. Don't apologize to me. This hasn't happened to me since I was a rookie. Why don't we have a drink on the way downtown? No, oh, it suits me. You know Al's on Front Street? Yeah, that's fine. Any place. I'll phone in from there and have Collins check me off duty. $1.60, That's good enough. Keep it. Oh, thank you. Oh, here he comes. Drink up, Dollar. Guess I'll have to waste mine because it seems I'm not off duty. What happened? We're back to that stewardess again. 
The explosive has been checked to her equipment. Lab men say some twisted metal they found used to be a first aid box and that it was in her flight bag. Well, that brings Wilbur Wheeler back again, too, huh? He's being picked up now. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He was a president of several firsts. He was the first vice president to become president through the death of the chief executive, the first president to be married in office, and the first president against whom impeachment proceedings were introduced. He graduated from William and Mary College at 17, and at 26 was elected to Congress. During his administration, a treaty was signed which opened the door to oriental trade for the first time. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more important clue. On the last day of his term, he signed a resolution providing for the annexation of Texas. Who was he? John Tyler, 10th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I don't like the idea of being loaded into a police car twice in one day with everybody in the block gawking at me. A lot of people have been loaded into police cars today. They were glad to come in and do anything they could to help clear this up. Oh, I want to help, too. Uh, I didn't mean it that way. You're glad to hear that. How long have you worked for the Fairway Airline? Oh, about a year and a half, I think. What'd you do before that? I want to know why you're asking questions like that. Why did you bring me back here? Because some new evidence has turned up, that's why. Oh. What does it have to do with me? It has to do with Shirley Goodhue. Uh, I don't know what you mean, I... I don't know what you're talking about. I told you everything there was about her and me. Did you know that she carried a first aid kit aboard the plane last night? First aid kit? I don't know what you mean. You don't? After working there a year and a half? What did you do on the plane? Oh, brought food on, checked the water, a few other things. Things that the stewardess would be involved in. She'd be there with you, wouldn't she? Yeah, but I don't know what you're driving at. I don't know what you mean. Where did she put her first aid kit, Wheeler? Well, why do you ask me that? I don't remember. I, I didn't notice. They had a place they kept it, but I didn't notice. Was it open? I don't know. What was in it? Well, if I knew what you meant, I... I don't know why you're asking me these things. Look, each stewardess has a kit. They take it off the plane when they leave, and they bring it aboard when they report for work. I don't know what you're talking about. The explosive, Wheeler, the nitroglycerin that was hidden in her first aid kit. Well, I didn't put it there. Well, that's what you mean, but but I didn't do it. I don't know anything about it. Thirteen people in the plane, Wheeler. Four people in one of the houses that crashed. Probably two more in the other. I didn't do it. I didn't. I didn't do it. Wilbur Wheeler was turned over to the police psychiatrist. The web that was tightening around him was only circumstantial. And the question was... Did he know that he could keep on saying he hadn't done it and that we couldn't do anything without physical proof? Or was he innocent? Our last move that night was to go to Wheeler's room. We were looking for a wire that could be checked to that used with the explosive. We didn't find that or anything else that could be a definite help. But a couple of things we didn't find seemed strange. Hey, you said he came home and turned on his radio. There isn't a radio here. A newspaper's dollar, see any? No, no, I don't. No. No, there aren't any. Unless he's got them out of sight someplace. Well, why would he do that? No. Nope. Not in the wastebasket. You'd think a man so close to this would want to find out what the papers were saying, wouldn't you? Guilty or innocent? Yeah. Well, I don't know, Dollar. I'm bushed. Let's drop it for tonight. <laughs> The next day, Lenhardt and I talked to the psychiatrist, who'd spent a couple of hours with Wheeler. 
The doctor said that Wheeler was definitely suffering from a severe guilt complex. But whether that meant he had actually committed the crime or had only wished secretly that harm would come to Miss Goodyear wasn't clear yet. In terms of evidence, that meant nothing. The lack of a radio or newspaper in his room, the doctor tossed off as meaning merely that Wheeler was hiding from actuality. As Captain Lenhart put it, if that doctor thinks he helped my mental condition, he's wrong. That afternoon, a development came from the fairway office of Carl Reed. He'd been unable to locate another of his stewardesses. And when finally he'd sent someone to her apartment, she'd been found, shot to death. We met Mr. Reed at the scene of the second crime. I, I simply had to get back on the job today. Two of our flights were delayed yesterday because of my going to pieces. You better watch it now, Mr. Reed. I, I don't know if I... Now, just take it easy. You tried to phone this girl and tell her to report for one of your flights. And when you sent somebody out here, she was found dead, huh? Yes, exactly. I, I hadn't tried to contact Alice before because I... Well, I, I knew that she and Miss Goodyear had been close friends and that she must have felt almost responsible for her death. Why, Mr. Reed? Why? Well, she was scheduled for the flight the other night. I, I thought you knew that. No, no, we didn't. I wish we had. But I told you. That night at the scene of the crash. I was talking to her mother, Mrs. Goodyear. Yes, I remember that. You said she thought there was a chance her daughter wasn't on the plane. But I... I... Told you the other girl was scheduled? No, no, Mr. Reed. You made it sound like Mrs. Goodyear thought her daughter was on a different flight. You didn't say anything about another stewardess. Good Lord. It's all right, Mr. Reed. The human mind isn't infallible, but it can correct its mistakes. Tell us now. Well, that... That's all right. <laughs> well, with, with everything else, I, I, I suppose it didn't seem important. I... Well, I... I know our procedure is less, uh, Thank you, well, less exact than the regular companies. I... You see, the, the girls often traded flights. When did you find out about this trade? Well, n not until Mrs. Goodyear told me that her daughter had gone to work that night. You didn't discuss it with her by any chance? No, I, I didn't discuss it. Well, that night and, and all of it, I. Then I think we'd better go see Mrs. Goodyear, Dollar. Can. We've just learned that your daughter wasn't scheduled to be on that plane, Mrs. Goodyear. Well, no, she wasn't. We understand that she and Alice Turner exchanged flights quite often. But do you know how it happened the other night? No. Shirley was here at home and the phone rang. What time was that, please? Oh, I hardly remember. We'd had an early dinner and... The plane took off at 8.25. How long before then? Well, an hour at least. No, it was less than that because... Shirley left in such a hurry. What did she say? Well, she said that one of the girls was sick and she was going to take her place on the flight. Just up to Maine and back. She said... She said she'd be home soon after midnight. I've never liked rush decisions and I've always worried when Shirley left in a hurry like that. She did it quite often? Yes, they, they all did it. Six of them live here in Hartford. I never liked it. Did she trade more often with Alice Turner than with the others, do you know? Oh, I don't think so. It was an agreement. If one of them couldn't work, one of the others would fill in. Then it's possible that Alice Turner called some of the others before she called your daughter. Yes, it's quite possible. The horror of the crime led to the solving of it. Late that afternoon, I'd gone back to my apartment building, and in the corridor, just outside my door... Hey. hey. Your name, Doctor? Yeah. Can I help you? Hey. I want to talk to you. I think we'd better go inside. Well, I'm pretty busy. Yes, I know you are, but uh, I want to talk to you about the, the plane explosion. Oh. All right. Come on in. Thank you. I can't stand it anymore. I, I read about Alice Turner this afternoon. Uh, 
just can't stand it, that's all. What do you know about it? Well, just that all those people kill for nothing, and I'm partly to blame, too, and I'm ready to give myself up. Well, why did you come to me, then? Why didn't you go to the police? Well, you can talk to somebody like you. The police are always building the case for the estate. Okay. They'll get you anyway. Yeah, but you'll know what I really said, see? All right, go ahead. His name is Church. Arthur Church. Who's Arthur Church? He's the chief pusher for a bigger narcotics outfit than you ever thought there was. We've had a few cranks in this case already. I know crank. What do you mean, Emmerich? Alice Turner was carrying the stuff for him. She wanted to get out, and the church wouldn't let her. So she got smart and set up a meeting with a federal man the other night. And that's why she was killed, and all the rest of them, too. Doesn't make sense. If she'd made this date, don't you think the federal authorities would have been in on this? Well, she didn't tell them who she was or what she did. How do you know, Alice? I'm the one that told her church was on to her. I told her to drop it. Sure, not to go. That's my part of it. I told her church was on to it and that he'd stop her somewhere. I told her to drop it no matter what. I don't like it. No. Why would she put Shirley Goodhue on the spot? Alice didn't know what would happen. I did. Who could know that he'd do anything like this? Well, why did he? If what you say is true, he could have stopped her some other way. That's my doing, too. I kept her out of sight, you see. And the other night, I told her not to do anything, to stay where she was, and not to go to the field. And, and then she believed me. And then she called Shirley Goodhue and told her she was sick. And that's why she didn't go. Do you know where the explosive was that wrecked the plane? Yes. yes I read today the first aid kit. That's where Alice carried the stuff. And it was her kit. How did the Goodhue girl get it? Yeah, because she was called at the last minute, you see. And Alice had her things in a locker at the field. Uh, oh, look, Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't telling the truth. It's a peddling rap for me, don't you see? But I've been reading these stories about the people that get killed and the families that are left, and I couldn't take it. Uh, I knew the truth, and then when Alice was killed, well, there was no reason for me not telling what I knew. Are you ready to go to the police? You heard what I got to say. I, I'm giving myself up, so... You know where this Arthur Church is? Yes, yes, yes. He, he and I live together. And you'll come with us? If I have to. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'll take you up there. This is it, Moran. This is where I left him. You go in then. Tell him who's here. Uh. Just call him naturally. Account item two, miscellaneous, twenty three dollars and forty five cents. Expense account total, twenty five dollars and ninety five cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 